Morning, I'm Dr. Gopal Narayan Swami, this is Dr. Keith Bros. Today we're going to show you how to insert a pigtail catheter. Uh, we'll first begin with um, uh, Keith demonstrating to us uh, how to set up a pleurovac. You want to set up a pleurovac prior to um, um, setting up the pigtail catheter itself. Keith, you want to start with the pleurovac? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, you know, with any procedure, first is you have to get all your equipment together. So, you know, you have your pleurovac, you open it up, and you can set this up. And then when we get started, we're going to actually uh, do this under a full sterile technique. So I've arranged here a gown and a uh, cover, as well as I have my kit and a hat and mask and sterile gloves. And like I said, this will be done under full sterile technique. Um, also, I will position the patient for this procedure with the arm up over his head to give me access to the mid-axillary line in the fifth or sixth, even the third or fourth intercostal space. Uh, you know, depending on the location of the uh, effusion or pneumothorax that we're attempting to uh, correct. Uh, so this will be our, our uh, area of interest here in the mid-axillary line. So first things first, let's set up our pleurovac so that we're ready for the procedure. So you take it out of the box. I can put that in the trash. That for you. <clears throat> and you'll notice you have a collection chamber here. You have a, this is your air leak indicator, and this is your water seal here. And then this is your, uh, this column over here, which you also put water in, is your suction limitation, so that you don't uh, have too much suction. It sort of protects you from the direct suction from the wall. Um, so what you could do is open this up, make sure everything uh, works. What you'll do is you'll make sure that these valves are able to spin, which they are. And this is the patient, this is the end it has a sterile connector that will actually ultimately attach to the chest tube and drain into the collection chamber. So first things first, we need to fill this with water. Generally, you prefer to use sterile water as opposed to normal saline because the salt, eventually, as the water evaporates, may accumulate and gunk up your uh, device. So this will go on the floor. It has a, a thing here to spin so that it'll actually uh, stand up straight. Hmm. So, can you hand me that sterile water, please, Gopal? Sure. So for this part, I'm going to open up the water. Really, any water is okay. Make sure my valve is open. And you're going to pour the water into this collection. And you'll see it go in there. And it turns blue automatically. Add a little bit more. Okay, and that should be good. Make sure it's distributed. And it is. And then you also want to add water here to limit your suction. So normally we put it somewhere between 15 and 20. That should be fine. Okay, so now this is ready. We're ultimately going to connect this. If you want to go to suction, you'll connect this then to the suction. This piece uh, is easily removed, and you can connect it to the suction. But for our purposes, uh, I'm going to leave that alone for the moment, and we'll uh, connect this to the patient when we're ready. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get in my sterile gown, and then Dr. Gopal here will assist me in opening up things so that we can uh, proceed with the... Uh, with the placement of the pigtail catheter. Okay, now that we have our pleurovac set up, um, Dr. Rose or Keith is going to show us how to insert the weight pneumothorax um, catheter uh, into the patients. We have the patient already sterile and clean, and uh, he's going to put the gown on just to show you what the kit looks like. Um, it's called a weight pneumothorax tray and is manufactured by, Keith, uh, by Cook. Not key. Go ahead, Keith. This is the Cook pneumothorax kit. Uh, it's a 14 French catheter with a pigtail, and I'm going to show you the kit in detail as I open it up. But first, I'd like to uh, do a full sterile uh, gown and drape on the patient. So I've already uh, put my sterile gown and gloves, and his patient has been appropriately clean with chlorhexidine. I'm now going to put the uh, patient cover on him. Remember, orient head to feet. So this is the head end, and I've removed the one sheet here, and I'm leaving this sheet on. This is for the left-sided uh, uh, placement of the catheter. So this circle is going to be my operating area, and I'm going to put it right around here around the fourth intercostal space, which is my target in this patient. Um, again, it's going to be mid-axillary line is best done. To put them posteriorly, sometimes you need to if there's a, a certain collection of fluid or pneumothorax, but unfortunately, uh, that's very uncomfortable for the patient. As when they lie on their back, it's, uh, it sort of gets in their way. Go 
Paul, would you mind grabbing the very corner over there on that end and point it with me over the patient? I'm going to be careful and grab the underside right. since I don't have gloves on, but that should be okay. All right, so that only is. So now we have a nice full sterile field to work with, and my area is prepped and ready to go. I'm feeling for the top of the rib where I'm going to actually put the uh, put the needle in and ultimately the uh, chest tube. So I'm going to open up my kit now and go through its contents with you. My kit comes with a sterile uh, drape as well. This is small and we prefer to use the full sterile drape here. But you can use this if you want to for an extra, an extra area of sterile sterile field if you'd like, but it's unnecessary. We have gauze in the kit. I like to put that on the side here. It comes with an extra chlor prep, which we can use if you want to do an extra, keep it extra clean. And again, this is the type where you break by squeezing the two tabs. It forces the liquid chlorhexane into the sponge, at which point I can clean off the patient. And then discard of chlorhexane. Okay, so in this kit, we have a plastic trocar. We have a guide wire, which I will make ready to use by straightening out the tip. The kit has a couple syringes. It has a 5cc syringe and a 3cc syringe. The 5cc syringe we will use for the procedure, and I can use one of two needles. There's a longer needle and a shorter needle. I'll just put this ready here to use and lay it down. In the kit also, there's some sutures for when we're finished. There's a blade for making a small incision. And again, this other needle. We have a dilator, which is an important step for actually uh, dilating the track to put the chest tube in. And ultimately, this is the chest tube that we're gonna put in. Now, it's important, this is called a pigtail catheter because the end has a curve to it. And before you do anything, you'll see that it has a stopcock on the end, and you need to straighten out that curve in order to put the tube in. So what I'm going to do is insert this trocar through the tube, which straightens it out for me. And then I can turn this to lock it so we're ready. So now I have a straight catheter, and when the tube is in and I remove it, we're left with a curl. So for now, I'm going to leave it straightened out so that we are ready to use it when we're there. Uh, it has a, some iodine. And the kit has actually... It's a very nice Heimlich valve. This is really good for pneumothoraxes. It's a one-way valve that allows air to escape out of the patient's chest, but nothing can go back into the patient. So you can connect this uh, in the direction of the arrow to your patient. And you actually leave this open, and the air would be able to come out, but no air can come back in. Again, this is a Heimlich valve. And this end, of course, can be attached to the end of the chest tube when you're ready. Some lidocaine for uh, anesthesia, for numbing up the area. and two different needle sizes. It has a 25 gauge for numbing up the skin, and then we have a 22 gauge for going a little bit deeper. All right. And this is a small 3cc syringe. Now, we can actually draw up some lidocaine here for the procedure. Uh, shown. And then, I'm using this one and the 25 gauge needle, I can proceed to anesthetize the area. This is a mannequin, so I'm not going to actually do that step. And it should be uh, a standard uh, set that you would do with, with any uh, local procedure. So now, at this point, we're ready to begin. So again, we can just review our landmarks, make sure we know where we're going to go. I'm going to go on the top of the rib. At this point, I would take my needle and remove the cover. I've appropriately num numbed or uh, anesthetized the area, and it's time to begin. So what I'd like to do, even before I actually uh, put the needle into the patient, is to put a few cc's of saline into my syringe. The reason why I do this is as I'm pulling back the plunger as the syringe is going into the patient, particularly if it's a pneumothorax, I'm able to see bubbles in the syringe, verifying that I'm in the proper space and getting air out of the uh, chest space. So what I ask uh, Dr. Gopal to do is to hold up a bottle of saline for me. I'm using a blunt tip needle. Push down. Oops. So 
three or so cc should be adequate for this. I'm going to remove this, put that there. So next, I'm going to attach the needle that I'm going to use for the procedure. Okay. At this point, again, I feel the area, identify the top of the rib, and I'm going to put the needle into the space here. As the needle's going in, I'm pulling back on the plunger. And once I'm in the air space, if it's a pneumothorax, I should see bubbles as I'm seeing here in my syringe. So now, at this point, I'm going to hold this needle very steady, and I'm going to take off the syringe. Now, this is a seldom drew technique, so I'm going to just take that guide wire, and I'm going to gently insert it through the needle. Now, you don't need to put the wire full all the way in. You just need to go you know, a few centimeters past the tip of the needle. So once the wire is in, I can remove the needle, holding the wire, and have my wire here in my hand. And put the needle down into the sharps disposal. <clears throat> At this point, I like to make a small incision. So I take my scalpel, very carefully, I'm going to make a cut right over here. Careful not to cut the wire. So I'm pointing the blade away from the wire and I'm making an appropriate incision. It does not need to be a big incision. I'm making it just big enough so I can get my tube in. At this point, you need your dilator. You will not be able to get your tube into the chest wall space unless that track is dilated. It's very hard to get in without having it priorly dilated. So I'm going to put the dilator over the wire. Again, never letting go of the wire as in any Seldinger technique. And as I push in through, it's important to hold the dilator from the front tip. The back tip doesn't give you any leverage. If you hold it from the front tip, and with a twisting uh, and forceful motion, you'll feel a slight give just as it goes into the chest space. And that's a very good sign that you're in. So at this point, you can now remove the, you can now remove the dilator, and again, carefully put it down. At this point, we're ready to insert our chest tube. Now remember, the trocar is in place at this moment, keeping the catheter straight. Now I'm able to load this over the wire, as it's a Seltinger technique. And you'd like to see the wire come out the other end so that you never lose the wire. So now I have the wire coming out the other end, so I know I'm in good shape. So I advance the catheter and get to the area I'm going in. So at this point, I can put the catheter into the chest space through my small incision. Now, I've gotten a little ways, and at this point, I can remove the uh, guide wire as well as this trocar. This trocar is stiff, so you don't want to put that all the way into the lung as it can cause damage. So at this point, you can unscrew this trocar and actually begin to loosen it up, and then this catheter can be fed in over the wire and the trocar. You can remove the wire, and then you can remove the trocar, and continue the catheters in place. It does not need to go all the way in. This is usually uh, an adequate amount, leaving a few inches out. <clears throat> uh, at this point, the valve is, you can close it, or you can uh, to this way, or to this way. You can put a cap on it here so you don't have any leaks. You can close it off to the system if you'd like and you be, uh, as you suture it in place. However, if it's a pneumothorax and you want to drain it, you may want to in immediately attach it to your Heimlich valve or to your uh, Pluravac. So I'll show you how that's done. The way that's done is uh, opening, is attaching the, uh, if you're gonna go to the Pluravac, you don't actually want to use that. You can just do the Pluravac. But the connector tube here will connect to the end of your catheter and then open up the stopcock so that you have the on position going to the end. I'd like to point out that in this example, I, we put the catheter in for a pneumothorax. However, we frequently put the same catheter in for a pleural effusion. The only difference being is that as I was putting the needle in, instead of air bubbles coming out, I may have seen fluid coming out, whatever fluid was in the chest uh, causing the pleural effusion. Um, in this case, with a pneumothorax, you may want to hook it up to suction. However, if you've only put the tube in for a pleural effusion, usually it's adequate just to leave it to the, uh, 
leave it to the, uh, the Pleurovac on water seal and just let the fluid drain. Unless, of course, a pneumothorax has developed as a complication. And uh, you know, these things uh, require a clinical decision based on the individual patient and the case. At this point, Dr. Gopal will allow me to take this sterile end and I can connect it to my chest tube. And now you're free to put the Pleurovac onto suction if you'd like or to leave it to water seal, to gravity. These are uh, you know, decisions that can be made clinically to based, on it, based on the individual case. So again, at this point, what I would like to do now is to suture it in, secure it in place so that it doesn't move or fall out, and then apply an appropriate sterile dressing over the uh, wound. Um, and uh, at this point, our procedure is done. I'm making sure all the sharps are taken care of and put away properly. And again, making sure all your connections are secure. We often need to put a little extra tape around these connections just to secure them because this, you can see, may, may come off uh, rather easily. So sometimes I'll wrap a little bit of tape around here just to make sure that's a secure connection. And just make sure that there's not a lot of pull from the device. So make sure you have adequate room on your hoses and tubes so that you don't actually pull the catheter and put traction on it. It can be painful to the patient and may actually dislodge your catheter. When the procedure is done, the sterile dressings can be removed. Of course, like I mentioned, we have a sterile bandage on here. And the patient uh, will then have a chest x-ray to evaluate uh, uh, two position as well as any uh, for any complications. Thank you very much. I also wanted to show that these kits come in different sizes. This one here is a 20 French kit, which is uh, obviously bigger than the 14 French kit, but they make these up to a 28 French. Uh, all the difference is it's the same needle, guide wire, uh, syringe, uh, uh, scalpel. It's just a successive dilator kit. So instead of just one dilator, it comes with a small, medium, and a large dilator. This helps for uh, the larger tube because you need it to be uh, a bit more dilated. And then you actually have the larger tube in here. This kit is a what I call a bare bones kit. It doesn't have all the, the gauze and the, the lidocaine. So you may need to assemble that, uh, well, you will need to assemble that separately. You may need to use these for some effusions that are particularly uh, thicker liquid or, uh, you know, if someone has a large air leak on a ventilator, you may want to use a larger tube. Okay, I'm Dr. Gopal, and uh, I'm going to be trying and uh, explain to you how to get good views of the IVC, which kind of helps us in uh, assessing fluid responsiveness in a patient. Now, first of all, just to go over the equipment a little bit, I have my gloves on, you know, I wash my hands, usual uh, universal precautions here. We have our ultrasound. Uh, this is a Micromax, um, uh, the M-Turbo. I have it plugged on, you know, sometimes I've realized that I've started doing uh, my ultrasound exam and nobody's charged it up. So make sure, you know, either you are fully charged up, your battery's full, or you're plugged in and you don't want to be interrupted in the middle of an um, exam. Have it on cardiac mode here, right? We have the low frequency probe, 2 to 4 megahertz. That's what we use for cardiac exams, abdominal exams, and so on and so forth. And uh, some of the buttons that uh, you would have to be familiar with are um, there's the depth button, which is probably going to be the most important thing that you're going to play around with, uh, particularly when you have somebody with enlarged liver, there's some ascites, the heart's a little distant away. You'd really have to come down on the, uh, the down button on the depth so that you get the heart in uh, um, the appropriate view. Now, the way we're going to do is we're going to first get the subcostal view of the heart and then slowly rotate and show you what the IVC um, looks like. So let's just go about and hope that um, James has uh, good enough windows. Um, make sure it's very frustrating, just like the battery, just like the charging thing, very frustrating in the middle of the procedure you run out of uh, gel uh, which you need to make sure that you get good windows. All right, so we have our gel here, and James um, is lying supine. Sort of relaxes the abdomen a little bit. That's important, and sometimes you might even want to ask them to flex their um, legs a little bit. Um, but uh, let's see how we go. Now, you have the probe in your hand. You have the ultrasound machine, um, and uh, it's in the cardiac mode, which means the dot is um, to the right of me, and so you're going to have the dot here on the probe to the left of the patient, and you're just going to place it gently in the subcostal uh, area, right at the zippy sternum. Now, 
what you will see here is um, in different patients, you might have to do a different thing because the heart position varies. If you have somebody with emphysema, it's like a teardrop heart, the whole entire axis changes. If somebody you have obese, the heart lifts up a little bit. So there's no one way, but if you just place it at the sub Z point area with your probe pointing to the left, and then notice here again, I have to play with the depth because I have the heart, but I'm seeing at least about each one here is one centimeter, so I'm seeing at least seven centimeters of liver, and then the heart stops. And you notice I go down on the down button, now I have the heart nicely here in a perfect textbook image. It's your right atrium, your right, um, right ventricle, your left atrium, your left ventricle. Once you have this image, then you, let me just lift this a little bit so that you can, this is your subcostal here. Once you have this image, because the IVC lies perpendicular and about one to two centimeter to the right of the spine, what you're going to do is you're going to rotate counterclockwise. You're going to look at in the screen and see what happens. You rotate counterclockwise and the IVC should slowly appear here and look to the right. Now that's your IVC right there. Now you have to be a little bit careful about identifying, I'm going to show you, this is the aorta, okay? Now, you have to be a little bit careful that you conf don't confuse the aorta. You notice that my probe is pointing to the left. That's where the aorta is. You notice that the walls are hyperechoic and it's pulsatile. We'll come slowly point back to the right and there you have the IVC there. Now, one way to identify the IVC is you go up a little bit, you show it entering into the uh, right atrium very nicely here, and you see this hepatic vein here. Now, uh, obviously, James, um, you know, has been uh, maintaining a very good fluid intake uh, because uh, we'll go over this. His caliber is nice and full, uh, which is an indicator that he is uh, adequately fluid replenished, so as to speak. Now, where you measure the IVC always comes into question. Um, generally, we like to measure it um, about four centimeter from the edge of the heart, edge of the right atrium, or just distal to the hepatic vein. Now, you can barely visualize the hepatic vein here. Sometimes it's not visu uh, visualized. Um, so when you don't see the hepatic vein, you can uh, use about four centimeter from the um, uh, right atrial border. Let me just get a perfect view and then I'll show you how to um, measure it, okay. That pretty much is um, uh, a good view. Now here you have different buttons here. There's the M mode, there's the Doppler, there's the color, and there's a 2D. Whenever, what we are looking at is a 2D image. When you want to do an M mode, M modes are usually used to make measurements. Now you hit the M mode and you see this line here, and they use about, four, this is approximately about four centimeter. You hit the M mode again, and then you have this nice IVC there, and then you hit freeze, and it will um, uh, freeze it for you right there, okay? So, and then you can use these measurements here. Um, either you can do it visually, um, each one is about one centimeter, or you can use the calipers. You just go to the calipers, and you hit select here. I can take, I'm sorry about that, James. We can take it, and remember when you're doing these things, particularly when you're doing the subcostal and getting the IVC, you pretty much are putting a lot of pressure there, so it can be a little uncomfortable to the patient. Okay, so now we are um, at the point that we were looking at the IVC. We're at, you see the right atrium here, you see the IVC here, and now um, you hit the M mode, Get it about four centimeter, I mentioned uh, there. Get a better view here, a little bit of better view here, nice. Okay, and then we're gonna hit the M mode again. And then once you have the IBC there, we hit freeze. We'll just release the pressure on the probe. Just to get this on the view, you notice there's a little bit of variation in the IBC here. Now you want to measure the IBC in inspiration and expiration. And basically what we're talking about is the, um, uh, compressibility or the variability with respiration which indicates fluid responsiveness. Now just to look at this um, machine here, 
you have the caliper button, you have the select button, and you have the freeze button that we use um, to freeze it in M mode. Now, this is the touch pad, and um, this is where you, once you hit the caliper button, you will have this indicator here, and you use the touch pad, and then you hit select this big button here, and that says A, and then you will scroll down, and then they hit the next one, and that gives you a two point, you hit select again. So that pretty much gives you, um, this is uh, on expiration, as you see it collapses a little bit on inspiration, and then you hit caliper again, then another indicator comes up, now this is the second point that you can now use it where the IVC has narrowed a little bit and then you hit select again. And this is your second measurement, we call it uh, doing inspiration. And th then you have it at the other end of the IVC and then you hit select again. So now we have during, inspir uh, during expiration, that's when during a spontaneously breathing patient, um, you would expect the IVC to be of larger caliber than during inspiration where it goes down here. And that's B point. And uh, that's what we're going to be using for fluid uh, responsiveness, um, which is called the IVC index and different sizes of the IVC and different variation in respiration uh, will correspond to a different uh, CVP. Once you have the image here, if you want to print it, you can either save the mesh, um, image or you can print the image. We have a printer hooked up here. All you have to do is hit the print button right here and you notice this um, nice image that you get all printed out, um, which you can place in the chart to uh, just emphasize the findings that you had. You can also save the image here. Uh, you can actually save an image or save a clip. And you, this is where you save, and where it says clip is where you can uh, save a clip of the... Clip is usually reserved for 2D images because uh, that's like a video clip, and the image you can hit, um, save by hitting the floppy uh, icon here. So we saw how to get an image of... Uh, you can cover yourself up. <laughs> so well, we... to see the subcostal view of the heart and get the IVC. And um, what we're using more and more, the IVC size and the collapsibility with respiration to indicate fluid responsiveness. There's a lot of data out there um, to show that if you have an IVC that is less in diameter and is 50% compressible, or 50% uh, change in variation on, particularly in a spontaneously breathing patient on inspiration, that this person might be fluid depleted and is likely to be fluid responsive. There are a lot of numbers thrown out there, but what we are going to be using is, number one is the IVC index, which is the maximum diameter minus the minimum diameter divided by the maximum uh, diameter multiplied by 100. If the index is greater than 50, we're going to say that the, fluid, that the patient is likely to be fluid responsive. If you want a rough estimation, remember, I use the term rough, rough estimation um, of CVP with the IVC. It, it's easy to remember. First, you look at the diameter. If the IVC diameter is less than 2 centimeter and there's greater than 50% variation in the caliber on respiration, the CVP correlates with, um, it correlates with a CVP of 5. If it is less than 2 centimeter and there is absence of 50% variation, 10 centimeter CVP. Um, if it is greater than 2 centimeter and there's 50% variation with respiration, CVP is likely to be 15. And if it is greater than 2 centimeter, there is no change with respiration, there is, um, uh, the CVP is likely to be about two, uh, 20 centimeters. Remember, this is not absolute, it's plus minus 2 at least. And um, particularly in a mechanically ventilated patient, it might not be uh, as good as in a spontaneously breathing patient. Um, another caveat, you can 
as you know, have an elevated CVP for various reasons and, let be, and yet be fluid depleted in all cases of right side disease. We talk about changes of IVC with respiration. It's, it's useful to remember the dynamics of cardiac filling changes when you're breathing spontaneously versus mechanical ventilation, which is across the board positive pressure ventilation. So whereas in a spontaneously breathing patient, your IVC caliber is going to decrease with inspiration and increase with expiration. It is the reverse in mechanically ventilated patient. Because of the positive pressure, the caliber of the IVC is going to increase with inspiration, and the reverse happens. It's going to decrease with expiration. But regardless of that fact, we are assuming that the changes will reflect intravascular status, and um, it's the maximum versus the minimum diameter that, that we're going to use when we calculate the index. And again, in mechanically ventilated, sometimes this is complicated when the patient is making inspiratory efforts on top of the uh, positive pressure ventilation. So all these have to be taken into consideration uh, when we are using these parameters that we talked about.